Let's get to the point. And let's get ready to rumble. Hi, I'm Ron Klink. It's another Let's Get to the Point on Friday night, the 7th of May, 2004, in case your clock or calendar is off. We've got a, a panel that you're going to enjoy tonight. With me to my immediate left and to your right is Dave Copeland from the Tribune Review. And uh, it's good to be with you, Dave. And uh, to his immediate left, Audrey Gusky, Dr. Audrey Gusky, Associate Professor of Marketing at the Business School at Duquesne University. And you see her at, on At Your Service on the 10 o'clock news and the chairman of the Allegheny County Democratic Party and also the controller of the county. He is none other than Tom Flaherty as my dearly departed friend Bill Burns would say. So we're going to have a lot of things to talk about, and we will do it in quick fashion. But first, let's pay some bills. Again, good evening. I am Ron Klink, and uh, we find ourselves here as panelists uh, uh, talking this evening about, I, I guess, what a lot of people are talking about, and that is uh, how appalled we all are at the photographs we've seen this week coming out of Iraq. And uh, we almost made... Uh, uh, light of it earlier, saying, yeah, well, that's a subject that's not being talked about much, but you have to talk about it, because I think that as Americans, and I, I happen to uh, have uh, grown up very close to uh, the town of Fort Ashby, West Virginia, and down in Somerset County, we're right uh, across the borders near Cumberland, Maryland, and uh, to think, I mean, these are people who we know, they are the sons and daughters of middle America, who are now in these photographs. I uh, was in Washington, D.C. earlier this week. I happened to be with uh, Congressman Jack Murtha and some other uh, uh, folks at a, at a fundraiser, and it was the day that uh, Jack Murtha was quoted as uh, having said that uh, Iraq is unwinnable. And the point that he was making was that uh, in, in the, when, when you find yourself fighting in a guerrilla war, which is what we're fighting right now, you have a period of time, 30, 60, 90 days, maybe six months, but there's a definitive window that is open. And you must win the hearts and minds of the populace in order to be victorious. I think that seems to make a great deal of sense. Uh, let me start with you, David. You said you'd, you heard a, uh, a report today, uh, although I, I, I don't think any of us have, have, have heard the final, the final, but it just seems like more keeps coming out one thing after another. And now I understand that uh, Rumsfeld, in his testimony today, said there are videotapes in addition to the photographs. There are videotapes, and what I read, but didn't get enough chance to read it in depth, was that the Red Cross had delivered a report to the administration as early as February, outlining some of the problems at this prison in Iraq. And, um, you know, they chronicled, they chronicled unarmed prisoners being shot at. Um, they chronicled prisoners that had been beaten, one of which had died, um, in just conditions. And you really start, it's really, to me, it's starting to become a case of when did you, what did you know and when did you know it um, in terms of the administration. Some of, and I mean, I honestly, I mean, I tend, I'm not, I'm not affiliated with any party, but after this week, I tend to think that this is quickly becoming Kerry's election to lose. Well, and, and I think one of the things that troubles me too is if, if, if you had the reports, which they clearly had reports, and I, I believe Donald Rumsfeld when he said he didn't see the photographs. I, I believe that, and he's running a war, so he, there, there may be a good reason that he didn't stop to see the photographs, but why didn't you follow up on it? And the other question you have to ask is, what other reports did you have prior to this, maybe pre-9-11? that you didn't pay attention to. If you weren't paying attention to what was going on at this prison and you knew there were photographs and no one at the Pentagon saw it, what else is, is wrong within this administration that they're not seeing? And, and, and is this indicative of the way they handle information? It's a very scary thing because you wonder how much information they did have and when did they have it. And it's, it's appalling to the public. Um, as a marketer, I always wonder, like, you know, it, it's a matter of not that you market a war, but you need to have a good image of yourself um, in Iraq, and this is the worst thing that could possibly happen. For well, it's, it's, it's not only the image. I mean, it, the, the, the whole problem that I see with, uh, with us right now that troubles me is that uh, what caused people to attack us in the first place? They were wrong. Right. They destroyed 3,000 plus lives. Right. They took down the World Trade Center. They, they killed people at the Pentagon, and we were the victims. There's no question. Mm -hmm. But in our eyes, in their eyes, we were the great evil. And what we have done is gone from post immediately post 9-11, when the world was with us, 
they felt with us, they were concerned, and now all of a sudden we've become a great evil. And I think we're putting more and more American lives, not just military, but civilian lives at risk as well. Do you agree, Tom? I don't know. Oh, oh absolutely, Ron. I, I mean, the war was bad enough without what started out as a sideshow as far as the photographs, and now they seem to be all consuming on top of the actual war, and it just seems to be 24-7. And uh, just about an hour ago, I heard a, a, a perhaps the most recent poll in which the president is really down now to about a 42% approval. And I think that is certainly due probably to the last few days. And it certainly could be catastrophic if it is true that the administration certainly was aware of this and there's more to come because then I think it certainly shows that it is systemic and something that might even have a method to the madness. Maybe this is some kind of technique that perhaps uh, certain individuals over there feel is effective as far as breaking people or who knows. But uh, when that hits the public eye, I think it is uh, real trouble, not only for the president politically, but I think it feeds to those other anti-American sentiments throughout the world. It makes him even stronger, and God forbid, who knows what it could unleash. Our own, uh, our own war horse, uh, actually, I would, I would describe him as Jack Murtha, who I don't think there's a, there, there are very few people across the country who know more about defense. He's, he's a Vietnam veteran. Uh, he was formerly, when the Democrats were in charge, he was the chairman of the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee in charge of spending hundreds of billions of dollars a year. He's now the ranking Democrat, working very well in a nonpartisan uh, way with his Republican counterparts, whether he was the chairman or the ranking member. Uh, has been an advisor to Republican as well as Democratic presidents, has been completely nonpartisan, and I believe still is nonpartisan when it comes to these issues. Mm -hmm. I know Jack very well. Uh, yet he's being attacked uh, today, uh, people saying he's been co-opted by the Democratic leadership for, for saying something that he really believes in his heart that this thing is de facto unwinnable. Part of the reason for that, uh, I'm sure I'll, he would make the case for you, but uh, uh, we don't have a whole heck of a lot of troops to put in there. They keep using numbers like 138,000. Mm -hmm. That's what we have. Yeah. Uh, the Guard uh, and, and the Reserves, there, there are not a lot of Guards and Reserve units that can be called up anymore. They've been decimated. Uh, they've been at duty too long. Lives have been uh, uh, disrupted. Uh, uh, are we to a point in time where, number one, the war is getting politicized too much, and number two, are we at a time when we, if we're going to carry on, what I, I really refer to this as, as a world war, because it is a global conflict, are we at a point in time that we might have to decide whether or not we renew the selective service? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, there's the old saying that, that uh, war is just uh, uh, politics extended but by uh, non-peaceful uh, means, you know. And uh, certainly, I think uh, all wars are inherently political, but when you throw it into the mix that uh, this is going to be a very, uh, that we're in the midst or the commencement of a, what will be a very bruising political uh, presidential year, and in the aftermath of uh, 9 one, one I think uh, this is going to be fired up even more, I, I, and 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 uh, uh, I would uh, almost have to agree with Congressman Murtha at this stage, as you said earlier, Ron. If you don't have the hearts and minds in the first 90, 120 days, uh, it's going to be extremely hard. You think we would have learned from Vietnam, and uh, I'm not surprised that Congressman Murtha is being attacked. Prophets usually are especially uh, when we look back at those early critics of Vietnam. But uh, my personal sentiment is that he's probably more on the track than perhaps his critics, especially in view of the fact that the administration is talking about turning over uh, the government by June 30th. And uh, to my way of thinking, that's almost unfathomable. We don't know who we're going to turn it over to. And uh, you know, the question is whether or not you can make those kind of comments or should make those kind of comments publicly when there are troops still in harm's way in Iraq. We'll talk about that 
when Get to the Point Night Talk, a special edition for Friday night, continues. I'm Ron Klink. Welcome back to PCNC Night Talk. Uh, we're just talking a couple of days ago. Congressman Jack Murtha of Johnstown, Pennsylvania, made the comment as a Vietnam veteran that the war in Iraq was unwinnable for the United States of America. Our question is whether or not that's the kind of a comment that someone should make uh, when there are troops in harm's way. Does the, the, this kind of news get back? And, and uh, Dave, would you be con concerned as a reporter, and maybe these are the kind of things that as you do a story, you, you may or may not worry about the ramifications, that, that, uh, uh, is, that this would be the kind of thing that would hurt the morale of the troops? I mean, I, I, I look at it more as a political issue at this point because I've never covered a war. Um, I've never covered the military. I look at it as a political issue. And one of the things that has really bothered me about this campaign this year is that I really would like to see either candidate come up with a clear exit strategy of how we're going to, and they're just not doing it. I mean, we've spent more time talking about what Kerry and Bush did in a war that ended 30 years ago. And I'd really, I mean, I can't answer your question because I just don't know how it's going to affect the troops' morale. I know, you know, there's conservative commentators saying that releasing these photos are going to get more troops killed and the news media should have done that. I don't necessarily buy that argument one bit that, you know, these photos are there and if we start suppressing information, I mean, that's part of delivering an accurate picture of the war, so. Well, you use, use an interesting term, exit strategy. I don't think I've heard that since Vietnam. Well, well, it, but clearly we know there there was uh, the, the 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 similarities were being talked about prior to when everybody was laughing up their sleeve. I don't think people are laughing anymore. Yeah. This has become more and more of a Vietnamese a Vietnamization type of a war. Yeah, having grown up in the '70s, it sort of very much parallels what was happening, and people didn't realize it was going to escalate the way it did. And I, I think it's just uh, very frightening because is there going to be an end? And we thought it was going to be a very short-lived war, and now it's exploded. And with the pictures and the videos that are going to be coming out, you wonder what else is there that we don't know about. And is this going to continue? And, and now we're the bad guys in the eyes of the world. And that's a scary thing. Well, let's talk about another thing. Uh, you talk about we're bad guys in the eyes of the world. I had a very interesting trip a couple of weeks ago. I uh, went with the Department of, uh, the, the Agriculture Department of the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, Governor Rendell sent us down with the uh, Secretary of, uh, of Agriculture, Dennis Wolf, and uh, some companies from Pennsylvania to Havana, Cuba. Now, here's a country 90 miles off of our shore. People are starving to death. This country has turned their back. We trade with Vietnam. We trade with communist China. In fact, we've got the biggest trade deficit that the world has ever seen with communist China, yet we are not selling products, nor are we allowing the people of, of Cuba, who still love us, by the way. I mean, they, 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 you never felt threatened. They're so happy to see Americans down there. And uh, by the way, we did go there legally. They, they have lifted uh, the ban on the sale of food and medicine since they had a bad hurricane there a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, what, what's, uh, what do you think the general sense is as we think about a Cold War policy 40 years later? Tom, you have some, I see you kind of shaking your head over there. <laughs> well, I suppose the personification of it is Castro. I, I mean, he's been in power since uh, Eisenhower, and I believe that's, what, the last nine presidents, and that's amazing. Since 1959. Right, exactly. And uh, oftentimes, uh, symbols and we are talking about symbols here tonight symbols die hard and uh, he's certainly perhaps the last doctrinaire communist leader in the world and uh, I find it amazing that there has not been a melding of that uh, Cold War sentiment with uh, uh, Cuba especially in view of our relationship now with uh, the former countries of the USS, or, or the countries of the former USSR, you know, right. uh, who at one time certainly posed that threat there with their alliance with Cuba. But with that now off the map, uh, I'm perplexed too. And, and uh, I, I think a lot of it is the intransigence of uh, Castro. I, I don't think he certainly helps his own 
situation if indeed he actually cares about having normal relationships. Oh, he cares. He cares. We actually had, I will tell you, it was interesting, we we had a nine-hour lunch with Fidel Castro. Oh, oh, I can believe it. We said, I mean, he, he speaks he, for seven hours. Oh, he's, so he, he, yeah, so he I, really does. So I, uh, I but what, what was interesting, though, is that he, he, he was not uh, a doctrinaire. I mean, he, he was talking about uh, how they're training doctors. He was talking about uh, uh, their, their cattle breeding program, and they've mm -hmm. got to they've got to get milk for them, and the kinds of things that they want to do with the United States. They and they really do. But he also was very interesting. I mean, he talked about the revolution, and not in a way that he was trying to convince us he was right and we were wrong. But he talked about you know how they got these farm boys, and everybody had different caliber guns, and they had to count the bullets. And I mean, it was if, if I would have had a tape recorder, it was a book. Mm. Uh, but but he also talked about such things as the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he said, you know, later on I got to talk to uh, Secretary McNamara. And he says we almost blew up the world. Oh, yeah. How crazy we were! So he understands. I mean, he's he knows uh, the mistakes he made, and it doesn't mean he's done a, a full 180. But they also understand that times have changed, people must change, nations must change, mm -hmm. and I think 40 years of an embargo that hasn't worked is probably time to say. Let's let's do something else, uh, uh, Dr. Guskey. You you uh, deal with business issues on a day-to-day -day basis. What you know? Here's a country that is this, the land mass size of Pennsylvania, and about the same population, 11 and a half million people. Great market for our farmers. Sure, absolutely, and so close to us. And you wonder, like, why haven't we been able to uh, establish this relationship? And I'm curious as to why they brought you down, and what were the, what was their purpose, Ron? Well, we went down because mm -hmm. our our purpose was to develop markets for. Okay. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies in Pennsylvania has more pharmaceutical companies yeah. than any other state. Uh, our farmers would like to sell uh, a lot of food, powdered milk, uh, mm -hmm. beef, uh, uh, all kinds of yeah. things, uh, and it's, it would be a tremendous amount of jobs Absolutely. to the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, we're feeding people who really are starving to death. So I got to give a lot of credit to Governor Rendell sure. for taking that chance. He's the first big northeastern governor to make that step, right. and I was honored to be a part of the initial trip. And I hope. Mm -hmm good things are going to happen and eventually it will lead to better relations and peace and eventually if you can't convince them by starving them to death you convince them by showing them that our way of life works mm. the commercialization of that country would do a great thing exactly. to, to, to present uh, jobs for the yeah, hopefully that we have a lot of other subjects we're going to talk about too and we will be back in a moment but we're going to do some commercials now I was going to get on to another subject, but we're on we're on the subject of Cuba. We kind of every uh, folks here were asking a couple of questions. Uh, I was just mentioning that one of the things was that they they asked us if we could help them import sugar. When I was shocked, and I said, "Wait a minute! I, you you grow sugar cane. This was your biggest export. It was your cash crop." Mm -hmm. And they said, "Well, you see all those old cars out there, and we're keeping them, you know, 36 Mercuries and and 57 Chevys, and we're we're holding them together with chewing gum and wire, and and they're still, but their industrial equipment's the same." So. The machinery that they would use to farm and to, to uh, refine the sugar was 50-year-old equipment, and they can't get spare parts, and it takes so much fuel, they can actually buy sugar on the world market cheaper than they can grow it and refine it themselves. And the number one, uh, the, how they're getting their cash, which is what uh, Dr. Uh, Gusky had asked, is uh, tourism. They, uh, but, but they're looking, and this was one of the things Castro said to us, uh, the head of their interest section, in, uh, who would be an ambassador if we recognized him, in Washington, D.C., had, had uh, open heart surgery. And the bill was $78,000. Castro says, we paid the bill. But we know we could do that for less than $30,000 with top flight. He said they've got good doctors, good nurses. And they, they envisioned themselves one day, be, if, once we would have relations, being the place that Americans could go to have surgery. And they said, we'd save you $50,000 on that kind of an operation. And you'd lay in the sun on the beach to, uh, to get better. Now, when you, when you see the number of Americans coming back from Mexico getting dental work, and, uh, and getting cosmetic surgery in Central America, we know that if they have an opportunity to save uh, a few bucks, they will. But do you, do you, do you see, uh, what would be the will of the Americans to, uh, uh, to, to, to kind of lay aside uh, these old feelings and begin to, I mean, we certainly did it with Vietnam. So and let, curiosity. Yeah, and as, as you said, Tom, I mean, the, the, the countries that are now the former Soviet bloc. I mean, these are the people that were down there installing the missiles, aiming them at us. Uh, is, what would it take for, uh, uh, for, for this thing to melt and for us to be, be able to have normalized relations with a country that is that close to us? Well, I think it has already started to melt. Uh, we were talking earlier that there have been various people right here from 
Pittsburgh have been going down for the last 10, 12 years. And uh, I, I certainly commend uh, Ed Rendell's foresight in being the first uh, Northeastern uh, governor to, to see the opportunities there. And I really don't see or any uh, real impediment, you know. I, 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 uh, there have been some criticisms uh, on human rights issues, and uh, perhaps some of that exists. And uh, but uh, I think we will see it soon. I I, I I can't think of any compelling reason why we don't uh, start to have some sort of glass nose with. Uh, Cuba. Well, now, whether we're flying to Cuba or whether we're flying somewhere else, if you're going to fly out of Pittsburgh, things may change. We are no longer a hub. Oh, isn't that scary? We are we're a, a focus city. A focus city or a focal point or we're, we're something, but and, we're and folksy. I don't know what it is. And, you know, as consumers, what does that mean? well, we're wondering, like, what does it mean to us? Is it going to be higher rates? Is it going to be less choices? Could Absolutely. Could be higher rates. Come on. Well, How could I, it be? I'm going to take the contrarian view. I think this is great. I mean, I don't, well, I don't want to overemphasize it. I think it's horrible that you know, there are going to be U.S. Airways employees that are going to lose jobs, but I, I think that this is an opportunity um, not only for us to get more airlines in there and competing airlines, lower rates, who might be able to rehire some of these people who are going to lose jobs, but maybe this is the lesson that Pittsburgh needs, that you cannot stake the whole region's future on one or two big companies that but you need to start to happened to St. Louis and other yeah. cities it didn't work maybe in Nashville it tended to work but we're not that large a market and when you think about them trying to get additional airlines here are we really a big enough apple so to speak in the basket that people are going to want to go after us well, I don't know. here's here's the kind of trouble that we I mean first of all uh, our, our mayor has made the comment that he drives to Cleveland to fly out rather than, I mean, he, he's made those public statements. Uh, second of all, I will tell you, I have flown uh, from the U.S. to Athens, Greece and back for less money than it cost me to fly from Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. and back. Right. And I mean hundreds of dollars less. So the flying public is not, has not been served well from a value standpoint at U.S. Air. The 12,000 employees yeah. and former employees of U.S. Air, I feel badly. I had the great honor and distinction of representing over 8,000 of them in Congress. They lived in my congressional district. I fought very hard for them. However, just like with the steel industry, it is a new day and a more difficult day, and we have to figure out how we deal with it. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with what Dave has said. I think, and you also are, uh, as far as the consumer, uh, it, it may bode well, but as Audrey has said, as far as the local economy, losing those uh, high-paying jobs, and when American left St. Louis, I, I mean, they are nowhere near recovering, and that has had uh, ramifications throughout the entire St. Louis region. Um, I, I, it, it's just not the uh, the low-paying jobs because you're going to have those inherently when you have low fares. Uh, the uh, the the uh, the mechanics, the technicians, what have you, uh, certainly will not have a pay standard that current and certainly former U.S. Airways employees have had. But lo but losing that hub status, I think, will also significantly hurt that beautiful air mall out there, too, because you're going to be right. reducing all of the people that the hundreds of thousands, if not millions a year, sure. that, millions. That, that have layovers here and populated and, and, and uh, shopped at that air mall. It's, it's uh, the image of the city. You keep yeah. losing things and not winning. And so when is it going to end? And so if you're a business and you're thinking, am I going to relocate in Pittsburgh? Where am I going to go? Well, they are no longer a hub at U.S. Air, so maybe we're going to go to another city. And the other choice, well, the other choice for the flying public is Pittsburgh's one of the areas they're talking about will we'll allow the family to go with you to the gate. Now, yeah. that's, that's good right. for the people who that's operate right. the air mall because they have more customers. Right. It's worse, though, for those of us who fly regularly because those people are going to have to go through security just like they bought a ticket and they're preparing to fly. So what will that do to the, that, that, that longer line do for people saying, I'm, maybe I'm not going to fly out of Pittsburgh. Maybe I'm going to drive to mm -hmm. National Airport or I'm going to drive to Cleveland mm -hmm. or I'm going to go 
what, what do you uh, what, what are your thoughts about that? Does it, does it put us more at risk having that many more people going to the gates? Well, possibly, but I, th you know, my main concern is this is devastating for the city because here we had U.S. Air was huge in the city, and being a hub, we had a lot of extra people coming through and and feeding the air malls. And now that we've lost all of those individuals. The largest industrial employer. Uh, we've, we've lost about 10,000 jobs yeah. overall in the past couple of years. Yeah, That's huge. It and is. and it's, uh, I think, once again, it's just another nail in the coffin for the city. How can we recover from this? And how can we suggest we're a progressive city? Please come to visit us. Come bring your businesses here. Uh, you Last one out of southwestern Pennsylvania. Turn out the lights. Or is there a brighter day? We'll discuss <laughs> that when we come back. Well, you know, we were just talking about uh, becoming a focus city instead of a hub city. What does it mean people laid off by the thousands by uh, U.S. Air over the last years? And, and will U.S. Air be U.S. Air in a few years? Uh, Dave Copeland from the Pittsburgh Tribune Review making that statement just a few moments ago. Uh, Dave, you, you've said you were here about four and a half years from, from Boston uh, right, originally. I mean, As a trained observer, t tell me, well, you know, what, what do you see happening now with uh, southwestern Pennsylvania in particular. Uh, what, what kind of foresight would it take? Because, uh, you know, I've been here long enough to watch the steel industry go down, the glass industry go down, uh, and now, you know, we've lost uh, U.S. Air. There's, there's, a, there's been a, a tremendous number of downturns since 1980. Uh, and and there have been some upturns. We're doing some we're doing some things right as well. Great academic institutions, including Duquesne University, doing mm -hmm. doing some great things. Uh, what what would it take to begin to reverse the the kind of uh, image that we have as a, as a declining, dying industrial area? Well, I mean, I think it's it's a lot like having a stock portfolio on. It's like you diversify that portfolio. You know, you have your small upstart companies that might grow into be the next Microsoft. You have your steady industrial co companies that are going to... But when you're talking about a region, it's so many more assets than just companies. It's the universities, which I don't think this region really utilizes nearly as much as they should. Um, it's the hospitals. It's the quality of life here. And I think it's just diversifying and the focus that we put on those. Instead of saying, we have U.S. Air. This is you know our future. Or we have whatever the next big project is on the horizon. Um, I guess, you know, Tom and Ron, you're politicians, and it's... Was. But, well... I'm a recovering politician. Okay, you're a Plus recovering politician. <laughs> and Tom, Tom is a controller, so, you know. But, I mean, it's... Being in politics, you know that, you know, it's... Voters are going to notice a lot more when you're doing the big ribbon cutting on the company that's bringing 2,000 jobs here. If you paved the way for a small upstart company, you might be out of office, you might be in the ground by the time that company actually comes to fruition. But if you have 20 or 30 of those companies and you have a critical mass of industries developing here. Um, but P Pittsburgh also has had tradition. I mean, I've, I've, I've s seen it as a, as a news reporter. I've seen it as a congressman. I see it now in the private sector. Uh, we have a, there's a lot more difficulty getting financing for upstart businesses and for ideas here in the Pittsburgh region. And you could talk about getting the universities involved, but it's this is not the most conducive atmosphere to, to starting a business. There are there are some progressive thinkers around, but I don't know that we have them necessarily in the numbers that I've seen them in other regions. And I think that's that's why the Seattles and the Charlottes, I mean it's that can do positive attitude. We'll figure out a, you know we're gonna vet a, an idea, we're gonna look at the technology, but we're gonna get it into the marketplace. Uh, we, we're still playing some old school politics here. Huge, yeah. Taxes are so high, and my main concern is we keep losing all our young people. We know we're the second oldest county mm. in the whole country, and so what are we going to do? I mean, we need to keep that fresh blood, that energy, that vibrance here. And we do, you know, different programs and things like that, but, you know, Duquesne, we keep a lot of our students here in the community, but yet we don't keep enough, and I think the fact that young people are looking elsewhere for jobs and opportunities this is a very sad thing, and I think that's our biggest, biggest problem. Mm -hmm. How do we keep them here? Yeah. What do we do? Yeah. Well, I don't know if uh, if we should put all our eggs in the economic development basket. I think certainly uh, the mayor is coming under a lot of heat. There's been a, a lot of subsidies of our uh, corporations here. Uh, and department stores, by the way. <laughs> department stores. <laughs> Stadiums, tax incremental financing for for various projects, 
And they are certainly good, I think, in a short term because they provide a lot of jobs for, for, uh, for the crafts, the building trades, good paying jobs, but they, but they do not have the longevity that, or that would replace the demise of the steel industry here. And uh, uh, I believe it's more important rather than piecemeal trying to always uh, trying to cut the ribbon for 100 or 200 jobs here to have more of a fair tax policy. I, I know there's a great deal of criticisms from the small business owners when they see virtually that all of the 25 largest, with the exception of one corporation, not paying any business privilege tax, receiving exemptions through various ways, through the court or through the legislature. And uh, I, I think we could lower taxes if everybody would just carry their fair share more. And that may be more conducive to, uh, to, uh, to having a, an economic wellspring here. Cer certainly the universities and hospitals and cultural institutions, I think, are uh, the top of the line as far well, as this country it, it, but, is but, concerned. Yeah, it's the time if we, if we travel to Baltimore, we take a look at what they've done right. along the, uh, the inner harbor in Baltimore. You take and and Baltimore is in the same shape uh, with with the downturn in the steel industry sure. and and the uh, the auto industry. Uh, they had they had a big truck plant I think that, sh that closed down there. Uh, the shipping industry was on its uh, tail end as well. And you take a look at what they've done in Cleveland, Ohio. Right. You know we used to there was a mistake by the lake. The Cuyahoga River set on fire and everybody was laughing. They've done things. They've had some visions that have absolutely eclipsed anything we've done here. I had a friend, a friend of mine uh, who has uh, been in the real estate development uh, industry for a long time, and he said, you know, it took somebody from outside of Pittsburgh to take a look at the waterfront and Homestead. He says, all, himself and Cleese, all of us were looking at it. He said, we had the old blind eye. We still saw the steel mill there, and nobody, he said, but somebody else came in and said, look, this is what you can do. Yeah. And it is a real spot to go to. Sure. Oh, oh, I sure. think Pittsburghers are a lot harder on Pittsburgh. Um, I always tell the story, right before I moved here, I had about a three-week window, and I met so many people who no longer lived in the region, unfortunately, but they'd say, oh, I lived in Pittsburgh, or I went to college in Pittsburgh, it's a great city, you're going to love it, and I was, I'm from Boston, but I lived for a short time in New York City before that, and I moved here, and I'd introduce myself Can to I people. actually finish the story? They said we got to get to a break. Okay. Finish the story. Oh, right right. right. that's We're going to leave you hanging on this one. We'll be right back. <laughs> Hi, Ron Klink back with you, and again, uh, Dave Copeland from the Pittsburgh Tribune Review was weaving a tale of woe, telling us as we uh, left for that break about uh, the excitement of how Pittsburghers are a little harder on Pittsburgh than other people are. You were getting ready to come here and kind of fill in the rest well, of Well, I was hearing, uh, you know, people who no longer lived here or people who had visited here were telling me what a great city it was, and I was living in New York at the time. I moved here, and as soon as I'd introduce myself to people, they'd say, you know, you, live, you moved here, you know, why would you do that? And, you know, I mean, it's just sort of, it's, a lot of times it's just something that's, I mean, it's a self-appreciating attitude, I think, sometimes that people have of this region, region. It's such an easy region to kick around, and I think, you know, this is going to sound, I'm going to sound like such a tree hugger, but I mean, you know, I think sometimes you have to, you know, start saying, like, well, we have these great universities, we have, you know, great health wonderful rivers, you know, mm -hmm. we have recreational opportunities out the wazoo so I mean I think sometimes you have to look at it that way and start you know let's not dwell on US Airways let's look at you know some of the great things that are going on in some of these other industries so do you realize our educational system was rated eighth in the country mm -hmm. as far as the size goes that came out today who, so are, who are the other seven that were out of us um, they, they were I, I think it was uh, cities over a hundred thousand mm -hmm. so I can't remember some of the uh, Raleigh um, Durham was one of them. I, I think areas in the D.C. Uh, region. But so also areas that are doing, they're probably doing well economically exactly. as well. Exactly. But I thought that was a huge pat on the back for us as well. So there are positive as, as, things. As long as, that. but as long as, my point was, mm -hmm. uh, not to make you to recite the other seven, but the point was that uh, if there's a correlation between how well the education system is doing and uh, translating that into uh, some economic prosperity of some sort, whether right. or not that happens. Yeah. Is it going to happen? Well, hopefully it will happen. I mean, we're not, unfortunately, we're not moving in the right direction as of now, but we've got a lot of possibilities. And I think, as Dave was saying, we don't rate ourselves as well. And we don't think as highly. I, I hate when we always say we're the best kept secret in, in you know, 
uh, the mid-Atlantic area. We have so many things to offer. The people, the resources, the waterways, um, and, and it's just not happening. I, I think one of our biggest issues is the downtown corridor still, and the retail region, and losing Lord and Taylors, and losing Lazarus mm -hmm. is, is huge. We tried so hard, yeah. and you need that downtown energy and, and vitality, and we still haven't captured that yet. And we need to, I think, do that in order to really become a vibrant region in, in, you know, uh, across the country. And we, I mean, part of, part of that image also has to do with having the sports teams being a major league city, being right. viewed as a right. winner, and in some of our sports, we haven't really been winners. And that, that goes down to the bottom line of dollars bringing in enough money that you're able to pay the athletes. We've got some problems with that, would you say, Tom? Oh, absolutely. I think there's a, a, a great deal of resentment, certainly toward the Pirates. I don't think so much the Steelers, but uh, because of the financials, the, uh, the, uh, the premise that we would have a winning team with the new park and uh, we seem to slip even more and there seems to be more and more secrecy as to what the finances are. We're told that the Pirates are actually losing money. So a lot of it just sort of grinds against common sense and I think just sort of feeds on the dis disillusionment that, that a lot of the public have toward their policy makers, some sports teams. Well, Governor Rendell quoted earlier this week saying, uh, look, there's no choice. The city and the county have to merge. Hmm. Uh, is that a battle he should pick as the governor? And, uh, and what do you think about uh, uh, the, the point that he made? Well, uh, I think it is certainly a lot easier said than done. I don't know who's going to pick up the approximately $2 billion worth of debt that the city has now. And if they do merge, who's going to represent the city? Um, is it going to be the county council member out in the North Hills, what have you? Because they're talking about keeping intact the other 130 municipalities with their councils and auditors and mayors. And so the city of Pittsburgh will be uh, the only municipality without uh, representation. And uh, I don't know if Philadelphia is such a good example of uh, what occurs with merging. I mean, Philadelphia had their oversight board in the early 90s. Now they're back in pretty serious financial troubles mm -hmm. again, you know. And uh, uh, I, I think it sounds good uh, on first blush, but uh, unless the county's going to assume that debt, I don't think the city is going to carry that debt, especially with that having any direct representation. It's a very tricky issue. And in fact, I hear talk about it, and I don't understand it, and people I talk to don't understand it beyond just the first blush of merging the city with the county. Um, and we hear talk about comparing it to Louisville, Jacksonville, but they do not have near the number of municipalities we have, and they had uh, 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 miles and miles of unincorporated land, which we don't have here. And well, we've got so lots of corporations, believe me. Well, yeah, you know, yeah, I've it, used 130 municipalities, all, all competing yeah. against each other for the same job, so we're cutting each other's throat. Right. We will be back for the final segment of Night Talk, Get to the Point. We're, we're about to get to the point right after this. <laughs> Well, one of the other things we wanted to talk about, uh, there's this FCC indecency ban. We're going to have a safe harbor period from 10 o'clock at night to 6 in the morning. CBS is saying, wait a minute, uh, uh, the, the newscasts that we do outside of that, you know, you're going you're gonna to really threaten our ability to actually report the news. And uh, we have to have a journalist with us. Let's start out with you. Do you have any, any sense that, uh, the, that the freedom of the press or free speech is really being impeded by the, the right, what the FCC wants to do? Well, I mean, I'm not a broadcast type guy, but uh, what, what is it? The the safe harbor is from 10 at night. 10 at night to 6 in the morning. And that's when they can do all the bad stuff? Yeah, right? that's what they're saying. Okay. Um, so you hold it to the 11 o'clock news, I guess. No, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I guess, I mean, 
do you make do you start making distinctions but then how oh, like we were just talking what do you define as news I mean is Howard Stern who talks a lot about current events is that news you know I mean how do you define it I mean if he, has a, if he has a newsmaker on and invites them to take their top off and uh, exactly yeah. you know I mean <laughs> so how Stern are you going to define news and I think you get I just have a lot of problems with the FCC because I think a lot of times they end up trying to do the jobs of parents and they try and do the jobs and I'm I tend to like to be one of these people, I l at least like to have the option of being exposed to everything. And if it's offensive to me, I'll turn it off. Um, and I really, if this is true, if they feel that this is going to interfere with their ability to deliver the news, then I think it's going to be a serious issue. But 24 years in the, in the broadcast business, and I, I can't ever remember where uh, we needed to do anything that, was brought, that would be called indecent in order to report the news. I, so I, I would be interested in, and I don't know everything about CBS's claim, but they, I mean, they, they appear to want to go to court to take this thing on. I, I do not like uh, government prohibiting uh, freedom of speech. It always makes me very nervous, but on the other hand, you would hope that broadcasters would use common sense, and, and particularly when you are using the public airwaves. And I've always viewed broadcasting that way. The public owns the airwaves, you're given the right to broadcast on it, so you mm -hmm. have to be responsible. I, I think just the public is getting more sensitive to things with the Janet Jackson issue and the Howard Stern, and so I think as a result, what we have is people being more sensitive to the 10 and 11 o'clock news, and, and so I think that's one of the concerns, the violence or the sexual issues that are, are being presented, and um, I, that's probably where they're going. Is that a reflection of life, though, that, I mean, the, 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 you know, people are using language now uh, in public that I, you know, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, you never would have heard. It's just, it's, it has become a norm, and not making a judgment as to whether it's right or wrong. Uh, I'm an old-fashioned guy. I happen to think it's wrong, but you know mm -hmm. they still do it. Sure. And the language is out there. Our kids hear mm -hmm. things in the school bus and the school that we would, they never would have heard uh, years and years ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think that's part of it. Um, getting to the issue of um, you know what's right and what's wrong. A, a good example. Friends just finished up last night. I thought um, we were going to get through the whole hour. No, no, I, I have to bring it up at least for a couple minutes. And you know when you think about a lot of the storylines that they have had, and even last night. I mean, you know, I, I watched it. And one of the stories is uh, Monica and Chandler adopted um, a child. And I thought the way they handled that was a bit poor. Because here they are adopting this child, this young girl who was pregnant. I, I hadn't watched it all season, so I'm not quite sure the, the full storyline. But they're adopting I don't even know who Monica and Chandler are, <laughs> but that's okay. Well, well, they're adopting this baby. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is, you know, if, if I'm an adoptive parent or if I'm a, 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 an unwed mother, it was just poorly handled. And so where are the ethics involved in this? And here's a, a very, like, trendy, fashionable show. And these are the morals that they're presenting and taking light of a lot of issues. Then trendy, fashionable show they must be talking about pcnc and i talk okay. that's us we'll try to be more trendy and uh, more to the point as we come back other friday nights we hope to see you here it has been a great pleasure we'll see you later on bye-bye